Hello, uh, I am Surya Shubedi. Uh, I am professor of international law. I am the author of the study guide on international investment law. You will know by this time there are four sections in this course. Section A, B, C and D. Each of them focus on certain components of international investment law. And the one that I am dealing with today is section D. Section D is focused on the jurisprudence of or the case law if you like of international courts and tribunals. You will remember that under article 38 of the statute of the international court of justice decisions of international courts and tribunals is a subsidiary source of international law. Therefore, it is very important for any international law course and more so for a course like international investment law to appreciate the uh, contribution uh, made by the case law. Because in international investment law unlike in other areas of international law there is no single global comprehensive convention. You have nearly 3000 or so bilateral investment treaties, you have a number of soft law instruments, number of guidelines adopted by under the auspices of the OECD, uh, number of resolutions passed by the United Nations either General Assembly or the Economic and Social Council. So, you have a big number of soft law and hard law instruments. Hard law instruments as I said bilateral investment treaties, regional investment treaties and international soft law instruments. In the absence of a single global comprehensive convention, how do these international investment tribunals have gone on to interpret the provisions of these different instruments? They have actually played a very important role number one, fleshing out the provisions of customary international law. What do we mean by a fair and equitable treatment? How do you define it? Different tribunals have taken a different approach, but overall they give us a good guidance as to how that principle should be interpreted. Fair and equitable treatment principle even if it is a hard law instrument is not defined in the instrument itself. For instance, a bilateral investment treaty would say foreign investors investing in such and such country will uh, are entitled to the protection of fair and equitable treatment full stop. What do you mean by that one? What level of protection is covered by this phrase or some other principles of international investment law in minimum protection, the international minimum standard. What do you mean by that one? Because no a treaty especially bilateral treaty can go on spelling out in detail covering every eventuality where things may go wrong with regard to the investment made in a country concern. So, at the end of the day disputes will arise out of the application or interpretation of either a rule of customary international law or a rule of a bilateral investment treaty or a principle of a soft law instruments that has to be interpreted. And again the problem in international investment law is that there is no hierarchy of institutions. There are number of um, regional arbitration centers, international arbitration centers like the international settlement uh, for the uh, sorry uh, settlement for investment disputes working under the auspices of the World Bank, permanent court of arbitration in the Hague. Of course, some cases will have more influence, some judgments will have more influence than others. Traditionally, international investment arbitration regarded as a commercial matter, a commercial arbitration, settling a dispute between a company and a, a government. But these days, thanks to the expansion of activities, a bilateral investment relate, law related case will have a huge ramifications. ramifications for the economic policies, social policies, environmental policies of the host country. So, it is not no longer a narrow technical subject matter anymore. When you have that sort of situation, what the international courts and tribunals do in deciding cases, investment disputes, 
between a foreign investor and a host country will have huge ramifications for both the development of international investment law, international uh, public international law, even in some cases uh, international environmental law or international human rights law, because there are so many crisscrossing issues. What goes on within international investment law will have an impact on other activities. So, international tribunals have to reach a balanced decision when making awards, arbitral awards, what are the considerations they are supposed to have and what are the principles they are supposed to rely on. Suppose there is a bilateral investment treaty between the countries concerned um, uh, uh, in a dispute, but again some of the provisions not covered by the bilateral investment treaties will be uh, will have to be relied on on the rules of customary international law. Some bilateral investment even investment treaties even say that when uh, providing protection these are the principles plus the protection available under customary international law or general international law. So, even if you have a bilateral investment treaty that is not comprehensive enough you still have to rely on you still have to go back to customary international law. Customary international law by definition customary international law they are not codified in a treaty. So, how do you interpret how do you apply these general sometimes a vague concepts and notions within international investment law that is the challenge for international courts and tribunals and the section that I am uh, talking about section D deals with the jurisprudence with special reference to a number of major arbitral awards how the principles have been interpreted and applied by these international courts and tribunals is the focus uh, of the uh, section uh, uh, D in international investment law. Thank you.